Hello everyone. Thank you for joining this special event on Geoffrey Chaucer and Cecily Champagne, Rethinking the Record. My name is Sean Cunningham and I'm head of the Medieval, Early Modern and Legal Cluster of Specialists here at the National Archives. Uh, we're very pleased that you can join us here at 4pm in London um, from whatever time zone you're in around the world. It's great to have so many people joining online to hear about this new research um, which merges literary scholarship and scholarship on the archives and the legal records. I'm going to um, chair the whole event, but we've got quite a complicated way of, of arranging the speakers and the responses. I'll just start off with some housekeeping rules. Uh, be aware that this is being recorded. Um, some of this information is already in the chat, so please feel free to look there and check it. Um, there are live captions enabled, um, and there'll be instructions in the chat on how to switch those on and off. We're going to use the question and answer function for all audience participation and questions in this session. So there won't be any verbal questions and only the presenters will be able to speak. Um, you can find this at the bottom of the screen and mm -hmm. people can post a question at any time into the Q&A section. If the question's for a particular presenter, please could you make that clear when you're presenting your questions and we'll make sure that they're answering exactly what you put forward. Um, it's also going to be an event which will discuss some potentially sensitive and uh, potentially triggering issues, especially sexual assault. So be aware of that as you're listening. Um, some of us are here in the National Archives building. Um, if the fire alarm does sound, which we're not expecting, we might have to leave the session, but we have a contingency for that. Hopefully that won't happen at all. Um, so I'm going to begin by passing over to Susanna Fine and David Rayburn. Um, just to introduce the other section of the presentation. So Susanna is Professor of English in the English Department at Kent State University in Ohio, and David is Professor of English in the Humanities Center, Eastern Illinois University in Charleston. Let's pass over to you. Thank you. The special issue of the Chaucer Review released today presents the discovery by Ewan Roger and Sebastian Sobecki of documents from the Court of King's Bench that established the nature of the Geoffrey Chaucer Cecily Champagne court case. The issue also holds Andrew Prescott's survey of the life records of Champagne, the first ever made. And it holds responses to all these findings by Sarah Beckley, Carissa Harris, and Samantha Katz Seal, who consider new perspectives on Chaucer that may now arise. A final article by Ewan and Andrew illuminates the potential for finding yet more life records on major authors and documents still lying dormant in the archives. With this historic issue, the Chaucer Review is pleased to carry on its tradition of publishing new evidence and courageous opinion on the life and writings of Geoffrey Chaucer. The court case of Chaucer and Champagne has discomfited modern readers of Chaucer ever since the unearthing in 1873 of Champagne's quit claim of May 1st, 1380 wherein she released Chaucer of all manner of actions related to my raptus. The term raptus has seemed to incriminate the poet as the offending actor in a sexual crime, even if the document did release him from the charge. From the moment of its discovery, biographers and scholars have striven to provide rationales for the apparent accusation. For more than a century, responses to the court case have sought to keep intact Chaucer's reputation as a moral poet, worthy of his place as the stalwart early progenitor of a line of later English poets. Many reconstructions of events tried to excuse, sometimes even laud Chaucer for having had such an escapade, creating scenarios in which the seductive Cecily was a spurned lover or a conniving gold digger or some other kind of female stereotype concocted out of sexism. In recent decades, feminist scholars have rightly called out such constructions for the all-male clubbishness of their assumptions. Meanwhile, the legal meaning of the word raptus has been much debated, with scholars ultimately agreeing that it denotes some form of coercive act, either a sexual rape or, at the least, a physical abduction on behalf of someone else. Whether one praised or denounced Chaucer, it seemed that the word had to indicate a conflict based in gender in which Champagne's will and autonomy had been violated. The findings reported here show us how wrong we have been. It turns out that the valence of a term like raptus is considerably more circumscribed for us 
than it was in the vocabulary of 14th century medieval law. And for certain lived realities, the word was called upon to address. The abundance of Chaucer's life records has led us to imagine that we can reach into the poet's personal life about which they give little factual information and even into his psyche. Instead, as the new discoveries show, it is worth reanimating in ourselves a sense of how unfamiliar from ourselves are Chaucer and Champagne and their world. We do not, ultimately cannot come to know Chaucer, although we can strive collectively to apprehend more of the many points of difference as well as the likenesses between ourselves and him. Chaucer's real self exists reflected and refracted in the poetry he created. And another kind of real existence is embodied in the critical edifices we continuously refashion or update or rehistoricize. The new archival records matter because they give us more facts to work with, telling us about an actual business dispute about the kinds of workers Chaucer sought to employ, a class of associates we have little considered. About the story told by the new facts, we will surely speculate and to fill in details. As we do so, we should recall Chris Cannon's adage that uncertainty is itself something we may be certain about. We are grateful to the National Archives for its support in facilitating free online access to the articles by Ewan Roger and Sebastian Sebecki and by Ewan and Andrew Prescott, which include color reproductions of relevant documents. We thank the editors and general department of Penn State University Press for their invaluable support of this event and the special issue. The issue will launch on the scholarly, scholarly publishing collective at the end of the event and will be available on Project Muse in two weeks. We turn back now to Sean. Thank you very much, David and Susanna. Um, okay, it's time to um, begin the process of investigating these new discoveries. And I'm delighted to introduce Sebastian Sebecki, Professor of Late Medieval English Literature at the Department of English in the University of Toronto and faculty member of the Center for Medieval Studies. Over to you, Sebastian. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much. Few medieval records have received as much attention from literary scholars as a group of documents dating from May to July 1380 that involved Geoffrey Chaucer and Cecily Champagne, the daughter of a London baker. At the heart of this group of records is Champagne's quit claim or release of 4th May, enrolled in the close roles of the English Chancery, the Royal Government Secretariat, releasing Chaucer from all manner of actions related to my raptors. The word raptors, which in legal contexts can denote rape, abduction, and much of the spectrum lying between these terms, has challenged Chaucer scholars ever since Frederick Furnival announced this find in 1873. At the time, Furnival was um, um, preparing a biography of Chaucer to boost his Chaucer Society, launched only five years earlier, the latest in a string of learned societies he had helped, um, uh, or he had founded, or in fact helped to found. Furnival conceded in his announcement that he wished, quote, this record about Cecilia Champagne had not been on the close roll, end quote. He was clearly inconvenienced by this find because it forced him to respond to fellow Chaucerians probing questions about the nature of this document. What embarrassed Furnival was not that Chaucer might have committed a violent crime, but that evidence of Chaucer's apparent crime had come to light. To Furnival, Champagne's quit claim appeared to be compromised that could be used to tarnish Chaucer's posthumous reputation and thus derail his own budding project of restoring the medieval poet's standing under the auspices of the Chaucer Society. The subsequent reception of this release, together with three further records of payments and quit claims, is well known and extensively documented in the scholarship on the subject. The matter was given significant impetus in 1993 when Christopher Cannon published his discovery of a second release by Champagne, enrolled in the King's Bench plea roll and dated 7th May 1380, only three days after the, uh, the close rolls quit claim. The most striking difference between the two quit claims is that the second version omits the crucial phrase, derap to meo, 
a phrase on which the entire weight of Chaucer studies appears to hinge. Cannon's intervention injected new life into the document, into the dormant debate about Chaucer's role in the events leading up to this quit claim, advancing discussions of the meaning of raptors and energizing foundational strands of Chaucer studies, in particular feminist scholarship. At the same time, historians have increasingly used the records of the central law courts to explore and understand the wider legal and historical context surrounding instances of raptors in the archival record and to examine female experiences of justice and the law courts. We have arrived at a moment when the field is asking increasingly searching questions about Chaucer and the fate of Cecily Champagne, while historical and literary scholarship appears to have exhausted interpretations of these records. The archive, however, has more to say on this matter. Today, you and Roger and I will introduce two hitherto unknown King's Bench records. These records clarify the relationship between Chaucer and Champagne and establish the significance of the two close roles in King's Bench releases issued by Champagne. Furthermore, the new documents demonstrate that a known Chaucer life record, which previously had not been associated with this case, belongs to the dispute involving Chaucer and Champagne, raising the tally of relevant surviving documents from five to eight. The result of our findings situates these legal, these legal wrangles in the context of the statute of laborers, offering a radically different understanding of the relationship between the poet and the baker's daughter. It turns out that even our most fundamental assumption about this matter was only that, an assumption. Chaucer and Champagne were not on opposing sides of the law. They were co-defendants. The two quit claims had nothing to do with rape or abduction, but offered a convenient way under the statute of laborers for Chaucer and Champagne to demonstrate before the law that she had left her former employer voluntarily before commencing work for Chaucer, irrespective of where the procurement had been involved. I'm thrilled to introduce my, um, my colleague and um, um, I'm collaborator in this work, uh, Dr. Ewan Roger, Principal Medieval Records Specialist at the National Archives. Ewan will guide you through our process of discovery and introduce the new records. Thank you very much, Sebastian. So the starting point for all of this came over a coffee in the cafe here at TNA. Sebastian had noticed that in the King's Bench quick claim, identified by Chris Cannon, that the handwriting changes at the point at which the enrolled entry begins. Because his hand takes over at a crucial point where Champagne's own voice commences, we wondered if this apparent scribal change carried some significance in the rewording of the two quick claims. And at the same time, a note in the margin, scriptum, indicated that enrollment had been taken from a written document. And we started wondering whether it was possible that an intermediate record might have survived among the records of the King's Bench that might shed light on the differences between the two enrolled quick claims. Because the plea rolls of King's Bench aren't the only records of the court to survive. Sitting behind them are a huge number of supplementary files, the court's own archive, which were not available for consultation at the time the Chaucer life record search was taking place. Over the 70 years since, however, many of these are now available to view, thanks to the hard work of my colleagues in our cataloging teams and their predecessors. So with my curiosity rising, I decided to take a look for any additional documents. In the first instance, among the recorder files for 1379 to 80, so that's TNA series KB145. And this is what they look like. These files were made up of two discrete bundles of records, a main file and a smaller file called the Preceptor Recordorum attached together with a catgut dong, as you can see on the screen here. Now the recorder files are annual files and contain records of proceedings in inferior courts and other more miscellaneous material brought into the King's Bench as the superior court. While the preceptor files mainly consist of process documents, including royal pardons, writs and warrants that accumulated in the King's Bench offices each year. So I looked through the recorder file and there was no evidence of any intermediate documents. A search through the preceptor file, however, was more successful. Having trawled through the main file, I was starting to give up hope, but then a name jumped out at me, Cecily Champagne, in a document which provides completely new considerations for our understanding of the Easter 1380 quick claims. And this is it, the first of two newly discovered records. It's a warrant dated the 9th of April, 1380. So that's the first day of the Easter law term. 
in which Cecily Champagne appointed two attorneys, Edmund Herring and Stephen Fall, to act on her behalf in the court. Not perhaps groundbreaking in and of itself, the appointment of attorneys in the central law courts was a commonplace occurrence, and the names of such attorneys were not always recorded on the plea rolls. But the content of the writ changed everything we thought we knew about the Chaucer-Champagne dispute. In the first instance, Champagne's attorneys were appointed in a case not against Chaucer, but against a man named Thomas Staunton. We'll come back to him shortly. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, they were not appointed to act for Champagne as a plaintiff in the case brought before the court, but as a defendant against charges brought under the ordinance and statute of labourers. According to the warrant, it was alleged that Champagne had been employed in Staunton's service, but had left without licence before the end of the agreed terms of that service. And the attorneys were received here and authorised by Chaucer's colleague and former mayor of London, John Philippot, as you can see in the bottom image, although they were not recorded in the plea roll itself. Now, while Chaucer himself was not named in the writ or indeed anywhere else in the file, it seemed highly likely that the warrant was related to the quit claims recorded in Chancery and King's Bench that same term, Easter 1380. Particularly as Staunton's name may, of course, be familiar to scholars of Chaucer's life records, even if the nature of the two men's interactions has remained obscure to date. Because in the attorney rotulates of the King's Bench plea roll for Michaelmas term 1379, so this is two terms before Champagne appoints her attorneys, Chaucer was also noted as, a, noted as appointing the attorney Stephen Del Fowl, so the same attorney Champagne would appoint in Easter, to answer charges brought against him by Thomas Staunton. Now, these were described in the entry as trespassing contempt, although no further proceedings were recorded in the plea roll. Now, the fact that Champagne and Chaucer were both recorded as appointing attorneys against Staunton in the months between Michaelmas term 1379 and Easter 1380, one of whom, Fall, acted on behalf of both parties, was the first indication that the established narrative regarding the Champagne quitclaim required reconsideration, as did the nature of the accusations being made. Crucially, however, it also changed the known time frame of events. If the two cases were connected, and it seemed likely that they were, then in order to work out what might have happened, we realised we had to look at the records from late 1379 rather than the first months of 1380 for any evidence. So of course we got very excited about this, we batted it around back and forward, and I realised that there was more that we could find in the records of the King's Bench. Because in the Middle Ages, any legal action proceeding in the central common law courts was initiated by an original writ purchased after the Royal Chancery. The writ was issued to the sheriffs of the relevant county, commanding them to take pledges or sureties from the defendant that they would appear in court on a specific set of dates, known as return days. If the defendants did not appear, or the sheriffs could not or would not find means to ensure their appearance at Westminster, then further writs would be issued by the court to try and summon the defendant to appear. All of these writs were returnable in that the sheriffs were required to return the writ with an endorsement of the actions they'd taken. And these were then stored in the court's own archives, bundles and bundles of writs each year for future consultation as a case progressed. And they're now known as the Brevia files in KB 136. As with the recorder, the Brevia series was not accessible to Chaucer's early biographers and as a consequence has never been examined in search of new life records. As we didn't know the exact date within Michaelmas term that Chaucer had appointed Fall as his attorney, it could have been any of the eight that made up that term but all of those survive across two files. And upon consulting both files, the original writ brought by Staunton against Chaucer and Champagne was identified among the writs of the Morrow of Martinmas, dated 16th of October, 1379. And again, as in the warrant, it was under the statute of laborers. The statute and related ordinance were enacted in response to the economic difficulties that emerged after the first outbreaks of the plague in England in 1348 and were designed to provide new labour regulations in a restricted labour market, to combat rising wages, and to prevent the poaching of servants from employment on the promise of more generous terms. It is upon the latter clause that Stornland's action was founded. He claimed, in the formulaic language of the writ, that the aforesaid Geoffrey admitted and retained Cecily Champagne, formerly the servant of the aforesaid Thomas, in his service at London, who has departed from the same service before the end of the agreed term 
without reasonable cause or license of Thomas himself into the service of the said Geoffrey. Furthermore, quote, although he himself, Chaucer, had been requested to restore the aforesaid Cecily to the same Thomas, he had not done, to, done, had not done so, to Staunton's grievous loss. Now the endorsement provides further details. It states that Staunton had provided the names of two sureties to prosecute, while Chaucer also provided two pledges, Ralph Strode and a man named William Mims, that he would appear in the court on his assigned return day. So that's in the first weeks of November. The sheriff reported that Champagne did not have property or substantial goods within the city of London that could have been taken as surety to her appearance in court. Now, of course, Chaucer's association with Strode, the common pleader of the city of London, with whom he would stand surety for John Hend in 1381, and a man he described as philosophical Strode, has long been known. That he acted as surety for Chaucer himself, however, deepens our understanding of the connection between the two men. With the original writ now directed to the sheriffs of London, all parties now proceeded to prepare their legal positions. And while originally summoned to appear on the morrow of Martinmas, the case, however, was postponed. Now, this is not an unusual process. First to Hillary and then to Easter term 1380, when Champagne appointed her attorneys. Now, having summarised the new document very, very briefly, there's much more in the uh, published article that we go into on this. There, of course, remains a question here. How can we reconcile an action under the statute of labourers with the quick claims between Chaucer and Champagne that followed? Now, as this small note at the top of the writ records, the action brought by Staunton was ultimately never prosecuted. So it says non prosecutum, not prosecuted. And so no details of Champagne's service or the transfer of her service from Staunton to Chaucer were ever recorded in the plea roll. A brief consideration of the legal proceedings, however, provides new context for the later quick claims of May 1380 and allows us to provide new answers to the question of Champagne's raptus. If we accept the basic premise behind Stormer's accusation that Cecily Champagne had moved from his service to Chaucer's service, there are three possible scenarios in which such a transfer might have occurred. One, that she was physically abducted out of Stormer's service. Two, that she was tempted, poached, or procured out of Stormer's service into Chaucer's. Three, that Champagne left her first service of her own accord and subsequently entered Chaucer's service. So let's consider those three options individually and the legal options open to Staunton in each case. Had Chaucer physically taken Champagne out of Staunton's service, he would have been liable to an action of trespass v et armis, so with force and arms, as well as an action under the statute of labourers. In such instances, charges were often brought against the individual leaving service, male or female, under the statute, and against the abductor as trespass v et armis, with both suits running alongside one another, but separate. And an example of this can be found among Chaucer's own life records in the claims of Maria Alkenbury before the Court of Common Pleas in 1388. John de Cologne, it was claimed, had broken into Alkenbury's close at London, taken goods worth a hundred shillings and abducted her servant, Matilda Nemeg, out of service v et armis before the end of the same service. And Alconbury therefore brought an action against Nemeg under the statute of labourers and a simultaneous action of trespass v et armis against Calaine. Now, no such v et armis accusation is found among the charges brought against Chaucer, indicating that if Staunton did suspect him of physical abduction, he deliberately chose to pursue charges solely under the statute rather than under the older form of action. So we certainly cannot entirely rule out the possibility of a physical abduction, the lack of any Viet Army's claim suggests that such an accusation at least was not pursued in the King's Bench. And as a side note here, it's worth noting that Chaucer's appointment of his attorney to answer an action of trespass and contempt does not necessarily suggest physical violence or a charge under the common law definition of trespass. Actions on the ordinance and statute of labourers regularly reach the royal law courts in the guise of trespass, as Sir John Baker has described it. And there's considerable variety in the way that lawyers at the time describe such cases, including trespass and contempt. But just as a side note, I don't think that necessarily implies trespass is being pursued. On to our second option. Was Cecily Champagne poached or procured out of Stormont's service, perhaps with the offer of higher wages? It's clear from the legal debates of the late 14th and early 15th centuries 
the issues of procurement were debated fiercely by the justices, particularly whether plaintiffs should pursue such claims under the common law as a form of trespass or under the statute of laborers. It was very much a legal gray area in which action, actions could be brought under the statute in instances of procurement, but potentially also under the common law, although with little guarantee that the latter would be upheld in court. So pursuing such a prosecution under the statute of laborers was thus a safer course of action, as the employment of a departed servant who had left without permission was in itself against the statute, regardless of the means of departure. And of course, in the final scenario in which Champagne had left Stormden's service of her own volition and then joined Chaucer's, the only possible action against the poet was under the statute of laborers, as no charges could be brought under the common law. Now, as we've already seen, at an unknown date in Easter 1380, Staunton withdrew his action, and that later edition at the top of the writ states it's not being prosecuted, indicating that Staunton had ceased to pursue Chaucer and Champagne. And this brings us back to the Easter quitclaim. So having established that the context for the close role release was not an action brought by Champagne against Chaucer, but rather an action brought by Staunton against both Champagne and Chaucer, a radically different reading of Raptus becomes possible. Produced less than a month after Champagne had appointed her attorneys, the quitclaim can in fact be seen as a convenient means of countering certain actions or potential further actions that might have been brought by Staunton. If we read Raptus as representing the physical act of Champagne leaving Staunton's service, using the language of abduction to represent a physical transfer from one household to another, the quick claim has a further legal utility. By stating that Chaucer is released from all actions or future actions relating to her departure, the quick claim frees Chaucer from any legal involvement with Champagne's departure from Stornden's service. And it effectively acts as a statement that she had left of her own accord or through the involvement of others. At a stroke, the quick claim removed any means for Stornden to pursue allegations of procurement against Chaucer as he could no longer now be linked to Champagne's departure from service, only accused of retaining her after she had already departed. Both Chaucer and Champagne remained liable to charges under the statute. The very act of admitting and retaining a servant who owed service to another was illegal, but they had mitigated two of Staunton's possible accusations and had secured protection from any future trespass charges. Now, of course, the fact that the quick claim was required in the first instance may suggest that Chaucer or his agents had indeed procured Champagne out of Staunton's service. The language of the quitclaim and the use of Raptus insinuates that something had taken place in the events surrounding Champagne's departure from service. And as we've seen, the lack of a V et armis action suggests that there was no, not necessarily a physical abduction. In the context of ongoing legal debates around whether procurement could be classed as trespass, it is perhaps no stretch of the imagination to see the use of raptus as relating to a servant being tempted or procured out of service, with the connotations of trespass and the language of abduction sitting implicitly behind the phrasing. The remaining charges under the statute were relatively simple for both Chaucer and Champagne to defend. Agreements for service were, at this time, not based on formal written contracts, and the terms of such service could be argued or simply denied. Issue could often be taken on mere questions of fact, permission to depart, difference of dates of contract, lack of payment, or simply a denial of retention, several of which could potentially have been argued by Chaucer and Champagne. Three days after the quick claim was enrolled in Chancery, it was enrolled a second time in the records of the King's Bench itself. And as Callan has noted, the language of the second enrolment differs from the first, most notably in the absence of the phrase de raptu meo releasing Chaucer instead from all felonies, trespasses, accounts, debts, and any other actions whatsoever that I, Champagne, ever have had. In Easter 1380, as we've seen, Champagne's interactions with the court were navigated through her attorneys, themselves clerks of the court, and it's likely that the actual process of enrolment involved multiple stages, with the text to be enrolled, passing from Champagne or Chaucer to their attorneys, and then to the chief clerk for enrolment. And at some point in this process, the text was revised with the reference to De Raptu Meo removed as the language was standardized to match the language of, for example, a general pardon. To the lawyers and clerks of King's Bench, the phrase was redundant. 
In covering all felonies, trespasses, and so on, the quick claim released Chaucer from charges of raptus in all forms. And if we consider that the King's Bench quick claim presents a third person voice, that of the attorneys and clerks of the court, there was no need to include Champagne's experiences in the formal legal enrollment against Dornan's charges. Now, it remains unclear how the letter releases between Richard Goodchild, John Grove, Champagne and Chaucer fit within our newly established narrative, although the role of the two men does appear to have been as accessories to the events of 1379 rather than primary actors. And for reasons of time, I won't go into this too much here. We've made a few suggestions in the article in the context of the Statute of Labourers, but without those process records of the London courts, it's impossible to give a concrete answer. And we can return to this in the Q&A if there's time and people want to discuss this further. So to summarise briefly, the newly identified King's Bench records provide a new context that clarifies the relationship between Geoffrey Chaucer and Cecily Champagne and requires us to reconsider the established narratives and chronologies related to Champagne's 1380 raptus. They demonstrate that Chaucer and Champagne were not rival parties in a legal dispute, but co-defendants against a third party, Thomas Staunton. That the actions brought by the two met, sorry, the actions brought against Chaucer and Champagne were not charges of rape, nor were they likely charges of abduction, but a labor dispute under the statute of laborers. And finally, that the quick claims of Easter 1380 represented a legal strategy by Chaucer and Champagne in which the language of the releases was framed and formulated within existing legal frameworks. They also demonstrate the exciting potential for new life records to come to light among the relatively unexplored masses of legal records that underpin the work and administration of the medieval central law courts, collections which can shed new light on old evidence. I'm going to hand back to Sebastian now for a few words on what all of this means for Chaucer scholarship. The Chaucer Champagne records are deeply and irrevocably tied to the birth of modern Chaucer scholarship. For one of his founders, Frederick Furnival, the very existence of these records threatened to um, derail his latest project, the, um, the M. Chaucer Society. And with the benefit of a century and a half's worth of hindsight, we can attest that Furnival's concerns were unfounded. In fact, Having had to work with and extrapolate from these incomplete records has enabled us to read Chaucer's life and by extension his works with suspicion. As Paul Strom has taught us, reading with suspicion is not a bad thing at all. As our faith in the intentional fallacy, that is the idea that authorial intention is of little value to the critic, began to wane, the shadow cast by these records on Chaucer's work grew longer. One group of readers went on the defensive, but let's consign their reactions to history for now. The more constructive voices in our field, first and foremost, feminist scholars and those examining social models of gender, took up the challenge to read the works of Chaucer and his contemporaries against the grain and through the lens of gender relations. What shifted into view was a world of hierarchies premised on male privilege, a world in which Chaucer's position was complex and contradictory, an alleged rapist in real life, yet a self-declared champion of female virtue in his guise as a poet. The difficulty of reconciling the two halves became an impossibility for our field after Cannon's path-breaking 1993 Speculum article announcing the discovery of a second quit claim by Champagne, one that omits the crucial phrase, that up to male. Rightly so, this second release, when placed against the first, suggested that Champagne was put under pressure to drop the raptus allegation against Chaucer. Cannon's find lent a powerful impetus to a new generation of feminist scholars determined to allow female voices and perspectives suppressed in medieval literature to be heard and seen. Had it not been for the incomplete record of the Chaucer-Champagne matter, we would probably not have developed, or developed so soon and fully, the sensitivity to read medieval literature with an awareness of female perspectives and of female accomplishment, and by extension, acquire the critical tools to recognize, study, and understand not only male power and privilege, but also the historical structures designed to suppress or erase sexual or ethnic difference. These scholars have taught us and continue to teach us how to hold Chaucer's scholarship and ourselves accountable for not asking the most difficult questions. Our discovery will therefore have a wide range of implications for Chaucer scholarship. Most immediately, the new records clarify the meaning of a handful of Chaucer life records that have monopolized critical attention. And while the new material further cements the 
litigiousness of late medieval Londoners and the surprisingly long reach of the statue of laborers, more significantly for Chaucerians, these records once more challenge our models of biographical criticism and the dated reading practices of anti-intentionalism with which we continue to operate. If Chaucer's anxiety of influence is anything to go by, whether searchingly in the house of fame or ingeniously through his retraction. He cared deeply about the reception of his writings and through them, his autobiographical persona. Any adjustment to his biography matters for the reception of his poetry as it reflects and refracts his biological self. At the same time, the new evidence does not remove the um, validity of arguments grounded in reader response positions. Rather than worshiping authorial genius and succumbing to the fallacy of the intentional fallacy, it is the constant negotiation between authorial intentions and independent critical interpretations that generates the intellectual energy behind creative literature. Because the raptus discussion in the context of the Champagne quit claims has transformed literary scholarship on sexuality and masculinity and the representation of women, Ewan and I thought it imperative to contextualize our findings in a manner that will do justice to the significant body of feminist scholarship on Chaucer. The new records would not, will not undo the countless advances feminist colleagues have made in our field. On the contrary, the history of the recovery of these documents is part and parcel of the fabric of modern Chaucer scholarship. The incompleteness of our knowledge of this case thus far was a fortuitous circumstance because it has given our field the opportunity to imagine Chaucer's guild and therefore to tease out its ramifications for reading late medieval literature, English or otherwise. Rape culture was real, creating an environment in which, according to Anastasia Powell and Nicola Henry, quote, sexual violence is tolerated, accepted, eroticized, minimized, and trivialized, end quote. Chaucer and his contemporaries lived their lives in its shadow. No amount of new life records will ever change that. But it's my pleasure now to hand over to Andrew Prescott, Professor of Digital Humanities in the School of Critical Studies in the University of Glasgow. Andrew is well known for his work on the Peasants' Revolt of 1381 and the history of the Cotton Library. He was also one of the um, co um, collaborators in Kevin Kiernan's Electronic Beowulf. Andrew has been mining the treasures of the National Archives for more than 40 years now, and he will reflect on the paramount value and future potential of archival research for historians and literary scholars. I was speaking actually from the National Archives, and I've spent a very enjoyable afternoon before this event going through uh, some of the uh, documents that we've been talking about. But one of the most memorable days of my scholarly life took place over 40 years ago, as Seb suggested, while I was uh, still a postgraduate student. My PhD subject was a survey of surviving records relating to the prosecution of the rebels of 1381. It's been assumed that most of the records concerning the Peasants' Revolt had already been identified, but I soon found this was not the case. In this work, I owed a great debt to the generosity of assistant keepers at the Public Record Office, as the National Archives were then known, particularly John Post, who drew my attention to previously unrecorded trespass cases concerning the revolt, which named thousands of rebels. These trespass cases were just unknown before. John Post suggested it might be worth looking at some little used files from King's Bench. These files had been recovered in the 19th century from piles of rubble in repositories such as the Tower of London and the Chapter House of Westminster Abbey. Hundreds of these files lay unexamined in sacks until the 1960s when CAF Meekings, with the assistance of younger assistant keepers from the Public Record Office, including John Post and David Crook, began to sort them in what I think is one of the great achievements of modern archival reconstruction. However, while Meekings had been able to reconstruct and list this huge King's Bench file series, the files were in a delicate condition with hundreds of documents strung on medieval parchment thongs which could break at any moment, reducing the file to irretrievable confusion. And these files could not be made available in the search room, but at that time had to be used under supervision. 
John Post kindly arranged for me to use the recorder files of the King's Bench in his office in the old PRO building in Chancery Lane, which had a wonderful smell of coffee because the strong room was also used to store coffee beans purchased by the Assistant Keeper's Coffee Club. The files were and are incredibly difficult to use because of the way the vellum has contracted over the centuries. But as I gingerly worked through them, I realized that the recorder files were a major new source for the Peasants' Revolt. An entire role of a commission against the rebels in Essex had been placed intact on the file, which offered a mass of new information about the outbreak of the rising in Essex. There were previously unknown indictments against the Suffolk rebel leader, John Raw, and confessions by rebels, which shed light on the political outlook and organization of the rebels. These discoveries in the King's Bench files are now being published on a database being created by the People of 1381 project, led by Professor Adrian Bell of the University of Reading, with Dr. Helen Lacey of the University of Oxford, and Professor Anne Curry of Southampton University, together with Dr. Helen Killick, Dr. Herbert Iden, and the Geodata Institute at Southampton University. And you can explore these records from the uh, King's Bench recorder files yourself on our project website, which is 1381.online. Having had such a tantalizing glimpse of the archival riches in the King's Bench files, it was very frustrating that for many years, because of the fragile condition of the files, it was impossible to explore them further. In particular, prompted by my Glasgow colleague, Professor Elizabeth Robertson, I wondered whether there were documents in the file which might shed new light on Chaucer's life, but Beth and I were unsuccessful in our searches for new Chaucer material in the files. But now, however, you and Roger and Sebastian Sobecki have triumphantly demonstrated the importance of the King's Bench files by their discovery of these documents which transform our understanding of the Cecily Champagne case. The fascinating thing is that these were not in the recorder files, where we might expect to find most new information, but in another writ series, as Ewan has explained. And this illustrates how all the different legal file series including files not only of King's Bench, but also the Court of Common Pleas, contain documents which will potentially transform our understanding of medieval history and culture just as radically as the newly discovered documents change our understanding of the relationship between Georsa and Cecily Champagne. Yet much of this material remains in need of further conservation, and it's consequently little explored and remains difficult to use. The Unknown Treasures Project of the National Archive has recently listed CP52 files from the Court of Common Pleas and made 5,000 or so files available for use, but there's still an enormous amount to do. Indeed, there are sacks full of unexamined files in the National Archive's deep storage in salt mines in Cheshire, and it may be that somewhere in those salt mines there are further documents which shed light on Chaucer. What I hope most from Ewan and Sebastian's exciting discovery is that it will make the case for the National Archive to make these masses of medieval legal file records more readily available to researchers. In our article for the Chaucer Review, um, Ewan and I used the title, The Archival Iceberg. And I think looking at these files, what we realized is that so far, we've really only been looking at the tip of the iceberg and uh, um, it's, it's, it's that depth, that undersea element of the iceberg that we now need to start exploring. So I'm very excited that this uh, discovery will give much uh, higher profile uh, to the King's Bench files and uh, I'm delighted uh, to, to see them getting uh, this, this degree of prominence. So I'll hand back now to Sean, uh, who will take us on to the next stage of the proceedings. Sean. Thank you very much indeed to all three of you for presenting that so clearly and with great interest for the rest of us. I think we really explored how the archives is hiding such a mass of information despite 200 years worth of exploration already, um, the complexity of the law, access to the law, understanding the processes, just beginning to see a lot more of the nuance of how these records are linked to everyday life. Um, but that's the kind of archival and historical side of things. 
uh, which is obviously an ongoing and difficult process to get into the levels of that archival iceberg. But now I want to introduce Professor Christopher Cannon, Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of English and Classics and Vice Dean for Humanities and Social Sciences at the John Hopkins University in Baltimore, who's going to begin the exploration of the literary implications of this discovery. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what a difference 30 years makes, both in the field of Middle English studies and our social and political circumstances. This is what I'd like to highlight by way of a response to the transformative discovery of these new documents, as well as looking back very briefly to what I think the significance was of my discovery of the second champagne release, second copy of the champagne release in the summer of 1990. I found that copy of the release in the plea rolls of the Court of King's Bench because I was looking for what a case of raptus might actually look like, uh, interested in the meaning of the word raptus because I didn't buy the standard apology that this most likely meant abduction as I was taught. I thought at the time and still think that the greatest significance of the copy of, release, of the release I discovered in 1990 was that it lay where anyone interested in knowing whether Chaucer raped Cecily Champagne should have looked. So no one had looked there for the 120 years since the first copy had been, of the release had been discovered by Frederick Furnival. This discovery was greeted with some excitement by my advisors, a legal historian at Harvard, and Carolyn Dinshaw, who very generously accepted a paper, the first paper I ever gave at a conference for the New Chaucer Society meeting in 1992. But there was no proliferation of interest then, and quite the contrary. Um, in, in this discovery. There were about 15 people in the room the day when I gave that paper at the New Chaucer Society. When I finished my talk, a senior medievalist in the back of the room rose and began to patiently explain to me, despite the evidence I just provided, that Raptus did in fact mean abduction in the champagne release, um, that I didn't really know what I was talking about. At exactly that point, Aranya Freidenberg gasped audibly from the front in the room of the room. I was grateful to her then and I'm grateful to her now for that fortifying response. It gave me the courage to firmly correct the senior Chaucerian. I did not yet have an academic, the academic job at that point, but it was also the most significant feminist response to the discovery of the copy of the release at that time. The subsequent take up the, of that issue was painfully slow. I think the significance of the release I discovered most of all was that it did begin to reopen the question. I'm not sure the discussion that followed was always productive. Despite crucial feminist readings of Chaucer, my article did not put by the apologist's position. You will find in the 30 years since that discovery, many essays and books that say Raptus probably meant abduction in the case of the Champagne affair, as it's sometimes called. The release I discovered actually removed the word Raptus from the document as has been pointed out today. So that raised a whole host of questions, which I think have been well explained now. And it is true that the legal process the lease refers to is now shown by Sebe the Sebeki and Rogers discovery to be about something other than sexual violence. But I think it can also serve to leave a key question open. As Sebeki and Rogers acknowledge, the meaning of raptus is still mysterious in the 14th century English law and particularly in the copy of the release we have long known about. It's still overdetermined. It's still confusing in the light of the proceedings that we um, have studied. For me, there's still something more to be known, in other words, about the use of the term raptus in the Champagne release. Some aspects of this issue and much more are taken up by the responses in the Chaucer Review. Um, and I'd like now to introduce um, those respondents to talk more about their reactions. So our first respondent is Sarah Beckley, who's an assistant professor of English at the University of Mississippi. She's completing a book on the history of scholarly responses to the Champagne release and Chaucer's narratives of consent and violation. She's the co-editrix with Carissa M. Harris of the ethical challenges of Chaucerian scholarship in the 21st century, a special issue of the Chaucer Review published in October, 2021, and co-editrix with Harris and Elisveta Strachov of rape culture and female resistance in late medieval literature published this past June with Penn State University Press. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, and uh, I'd like to begin by thanking all of the organizers of this event for the chance to be part of this incredible conversation. Now, my response in the issue out today views these new documents as an invitation to shift from individually oriented survivor discourse, which can foster voyeuristic consumption of rape as spectacle and promote victim blaming, to a structurally oriented approach, 
focusing on how Chaucer's narrative preoccupation with rape reproduces shared cultural assumptions that perpetuate sexual violence. What I would like to do today is to briefly illustrate what I mean by a structurally oriented approach to rape and survivor speech by considering Chaucer's retelling of the rape of Philomela by her brother-in-law, Tereus. Some feminist Chaucer scholars have argued that the unequivocal condemnation of Tereus witnesses Chaucer's sensitive engagement with the subject of rape and his indictment of men as a species. But approached structurally, that is by examining the shared scripts which buttress rape culture and allow continued victimization, we can see the scathing critique of Tereus participating in a set of myths that relegate all but the most extreme cases of assault to the gray area of the plausibly licit. So Chaucer um, <clears throat> opens his legend with an invocation of higher power, the Boethian giver of forms, from whom he demands justification for Tereus's existence, asking why he suffered Tereus to be born, whose very creation slanders all men, and whose name alone corrumpeth, it corrupts, it destroys, both a moral judgment indicating internal defilement and a physical one, making Tereus caustic like acid, he secretes venom that infects all who even look upon his story. The depiction leaves little room for ambiguity. We understand Tereus to be comprehensively toxic, morally and physically, uh, more beast or disease than human. And in naming it his story, Chaucer clearly delineates responsibility for its contents. The rape it depicts is Tereus's deed alone. Likewise, we find no ambiguity in Chaucer's account of the rape itself. By force, Chaucer tells us, Tereus has reft Philomela of her maidenhead, mogre her head, a phrase I'll come back to in a moment, by strength and by his might. So the act is described in legal language, Tereus having torn or stolen, despoiled Philomela's virginity. Um, the term capaciously representing rape as both personal violence and property crime. Chaucer clearly indicates Philomela's non-consent, Mogre, her head, both describes the violation of the will, the grey, and suggests her attempted resistance. It can be translated as despite everything she could do. He thrice reiterates the use of force to compel Philomela. The act is accomplished by force, by strength, and by his might, a linguistic plenitude which encourages readers to understand the act as comprehensively violent and links that violence to Philomela's victimization. So held together, Chaucer's discussion of Tereus and his description of the assault witness a poet alarmed by and critical of sexual violence. But they also communicate very narrow parameters for the recipients of such concern. The rhetorical extremity of each participates in enduring myths of rape as a deviant event, one in essence committed only by monsters, as well as myths that certain bodies are more violatable than others. The emphasis on Philomela's lost maidenhead echoes medieval legal formulae for prosecuting rapes, which affirmed the victim's prior virginity, at least in part for evidentiary reasons, and which continued to color rape legislation through prosecutory exemptions for men who raped sex workers and women of so-called low character, which endured in England until 1951, and which continue to find their ways into courtrooms in cross-examination of testifying survivors. We might think, for example, about how Chanel Miller recounts being asked about her choice of college and about what she meant in a flirtatious sounding voicemail left for her boyfriend. Likewise, the emphasis on Tereus's immorality and the assault's violence confirms for readers that rapes we should take seriously are the extreme ones, simultaneously communicating that assaults which do not display significant violence, that would be 89% according to the most recent relevant RAIN statistics, do not count as rape. The processes for reporting rape in medieval England likewise centered the display of marks of violence as evidence of non-consent. We might think again of the potential translations of Mogre, her head, indicating utmost resistance, an evidentiary standard which persisted into the 1960s in England and the US. And we certainly see this rhetoric publicly defining rape in the crime pages of newspapers by the Victorian era, where assaults described as brutal, exceptional or singular are represented as true violation, while those which were not often included defendants' claims that the sex was consensual. These habits too have shifted, but continue to frame legal thinking on rape. From those prior measures of non-consent 
to standards of mens rea for prosecuting rape, which still assign exculpatory power to perpetrators claimed belief in victims' consent. So the emphasis on Terrius's elemental evil likewise encourages readers to understand rapists only in extreme manifestations, similarly monstrous men rather than men we might know or men like us. Indeed, the legend closes with a warning against men that explicitly contrast lesser masculine sins like betrayal with the consolation that most men will not behave like Terrius and muddies the responsibility that victims could have for their assaults, noting that Philomela had done nothing that she knew of to deserve her assault, leaving space for her own unwitting guilt and exhorting women to protect themselves from masculine abuse, which likewise locates the burden of, present, of preventing rape on victims rather than on perpetrators. These myths too endure in contemporary rhetoric. We might consider how Brett Kavanaugh and Brock Turner's defenders levied perceptions of their good character to contradict their accusers, uh, or those who advise women not to drink too much in order to avoid assault. So this is what structural approaches to rape survival can show us. Even as Chaucer appears to treat rape as a problem worthy of serious examination and condemnation, he embraces and repeats a set of assumptions about assault which made and make it more difficult for victim survivors to pursue justice. Our understandable first reaction to these new records is relief, but such myths animate Chaucer's poetry and the work of unpacking them is only beginning. But this is the work that I believe these incredible new discoveries free us to pursue. Liberated from the need to assess his individual guilt, <coughs> a scholarly obligation, the Champagne release has always placed upon scholars discussing Chaucer's rape narratives. We might instead address such structural perpetuation of rape culture through its foundational beliefs. Thank you. Our next respondent is Carissa Harris, uh, Associate Professor of English at Temple University in Philadelphia. She's the author of, of Obscene Pedagogies, Transgressive Talk and Sexual Education in Late Medieval Britain and the co-editor with Sarah Beckley and Elizaveta Strakov of Rape Culture and Female Resistance in Late Medieval Literature. Thank you so much, Chris, for that introduction uh, and for your foundational scholarship on the Champagne release. I also want to thank the organizers of today uh, for their honor of getting me, of letting me respond to this. Uh, and I'm so grateful that I don't have to keep this a secret anymore. It was killing me. Um, so I spent many years wishing ferociously for the knowledge that this astonishing discovery grants us. I did not think that this knowledge about the meaning of Raptus and Cecily Champagne's May 1380 release was possible. I wanted to march into Westminster Abbey's Poets Corner, pull that man out of his grave myself and demand some answers. Now that we have some of those answers, I am excited about the new possibilities that they enable for, Ch for Chaucerian feminist scholarship. I mentioned two of those new critical directions here. First, I hope this knowledge spurs us to explore anew the role of servant women who occupy the fraught intersection of gender, social status, labor, and sexuality in Chaucer's work and in Chaucer's England. Second, I look forward to continuing to analyze Chaucer's and Chaucerian's vexed role in the enduring structures of rape culture. The term rape culture might raise hackles or invite accusations of hysterical feminist anachronism, but is nonetheless useful here for designating what Nicola Gavey calls the cultural scaffolding of rape. The newly uncovered King's Bench documents do not change the fact that Chaucer writes about content, consent and sexual violation in complicated, unsettling, and fucked up ways. It is irrelevant whether Chaucer the individual endorsed those views himself. For the fact remains that many of his narrative choices both reflect and reinscribe constitutive fictions about gender, desire, sex, and violence that persist in causing harm to living individuals today. Many of those wounded by these structurally entrenched attitudes are readers and scholars of Chaucer's work. As Sarah Beckley trenchantly observes, this new discovery invites us to read Chaucer in the context of rape culture as a poet who produced work shaped indelibly by its enduring structures. And in my printed response in the special issue, I tease apart the rich multiple meanings of the Middle English verb endurin to show how it can function as an interpretive charge for how Chaucerians can respond to this new discovery. 
Because these two new documents illuminate Chaucer's legal dispute with another man over entitlement to Cecily Champagne's service, servizio, it is imperative that we reconsider the numerous female servants, the wenches and maids, who pop, sorry, there's a cat here, who populates the margins of the Canterbury Tales. We must think about how these figures are subject to assumptions about women's labor and who owns it, how they embody gendered vulnerability, and how they are expected to subordinate their wills to those of others. We should scrutinize what precisely a servant woman is expected to endure in Chaucer's texts. Cecily Champagne's status as Chaucer's servant and as the subject of men's disputed claims to retain her service, should generate new attention to the maid servants in Chaucer's work. These figures include the maid and the wife of Bass' fabricated accusation to one of her first three husbands. What ruin ye with our maid, or why are you whispering with our maid? And in her invocation of the exemplary wise wife, who will falsely take witness of her own maid to deceive her husband. We can revisit the squire and maid who are ordered by their master, Arviragus, to convey a terrified Dorigen to uphold her pledge to Aurelius in the Franklin's tale. Who is entitled to retain or hold on to the bodies of these women? Who exerts power over them? What tasks are they obligated to perform in the name of service for those who employ them? In what ways does Allison's fake at false accusation manufactured as part of a performance of spousal jealousy to manipulate her husband, harm her maid with whom she accuses him of flirting. This new discovery requires that we attend to the ways that servant women in particular endured rape culture in Chaucer's texts and in Chaucer's England. It demands that we consider how they are framed as asking for it, how their assaults are reframed as not rape or simply an expected part of their profession how their intersecting disadvantages, coupled with the intimate domestic nature of their, of their working conditions, render them uniquely vulnerable to violation. This discovery should not be licensed to sigh with relief. It should not relieve us of discomfort. Instead, we can now direct our energy to grapple with how rape culture endures in Chaucer's work and how those texts and those who read them endure rape culture's structures and harms in all their manifold ways. Thank you. Our next respondent is Samantha Katzeel, who is an associate professor of English and the Shulman Professor of European and Holocaust Studies at the University of New Hampshire. Her first book, Father Chaucer, Generating Authority in the Canterbury Tales was published by Oxford University Press in 2019. Her current book, Before They Were White, Making Race at the Dawn of Modernity, is a reevaluation of the forms of racial self-fashioning in England at the end of the Middle Ages, with a particular emphasis on the racialization of Christianity. Thank you. And thank you too to the organizers for including me in this panel and to Sarah and Carissa for their fabulous responses. Um, all right. So two years ago, in the introduction to New Feminist Approaches to Chaucer, the special issue of the Chaucer Review that I co-edited with Nicole Nolan Sithu, I explicitly called Jeffrey Chaucer a rapist. And a couple other things too. I wrote that Chaucer is, quote, a rapist, a racist, and an anti-Semite. He speaks for a world in which the privileges of the male, the Christian, the wealthy, and the white are perceived to be an inalienable aspect of human existence, end quote. For Nicole and I, reflecting on the study and reading of Chaucer in a world ever more rightly concerned with the ethics of literate practice, it seemed essential to acknowledge how alienating and inherently exclusionary the reading of Chaucer and his poetry can be. And yet, despite all that, we refused to give up on Geoffrey Chaucer, to concede that what that poet has been in the past is the complete sum of all that he might yet still be. We wrote, like our pioneering foremothers, we wish to seize Chaucer from the comforting bosom of the patriarchs in which he all too often rests, to bend this poetic father away from the privileges of his sons, to make him yield instead towards that vision of justice demanded by his daughters. For many readers, however, it was our labeling of Chaucer as rapist that was the most significant aspect of the piece. That sentence was interpreted as a call to cancel Chaucer. The implication was that one could only read Chaucer or advocate for the teaching of Chaucer, if one did not believe the historical Geoffrey Chaucer to have been a rapist or a racist, anti-Semite, et cetera. That somehow by acknowledging the moral and ethical complexities of the medieval past and its most prominent representatives, we do some violence to it. 
Well, this argument is on the one hand, very much of the present political moment on both sides of the Atlantic. It has also been a consistent argument for the last 129 years in Chaucer studies, ever since Frederick James Furnival first dug up the archival document in 1873, in which Cecilia Champagne released one Galfridius Chaucer from all legal consequences de raptu meo. For as the earliest 20, early 20th century Chaucerian biographer Adolphus W. Ward wrote, such discoveries as this we might be excused for wishing unmade. And so in my remarks today, as well as in my article in the special issue of the Chaucer Review, I wish to reflect on what is and what is not unmade by Ewan and Sebastian's brilliant discovery. For while I fully accept their explanation that the historical Geoffrey Chaucer was not placed in legal jeopardy over an accusation of sexual assault against Cecily Champagne, I find it far more difficult to absolve the father Chaucer of the English literary canon, of the narratives of sexual violence and exclusion within which his critics have enmeshed him. In particular, I find it difficult to unmake the role that the idea of Cecily Champagne has played in Chaucerian biography and criticism. It is bad enough to confront the way that Chaucer's biographers use the Champagne release as a way of introducing erotic titillation into their tomes. Donald Howard's comment, for example, about sluts and frumps and hussies, or John Gardner's labeling of Champagne as a pretty wench, or Derek Brewer's winking nod to, quote, the lady if she was a lady, end quote. We're supposed to laugh along here, you see. We're supposed to even find it a bit arousing, this human interest angle. For as Brewer continued, Inside many a fat middle-aged man is a randy little thin one trying to get out, perhaps Chaucer sometimes did. How amusing. But perhaps still even less painful for us for female Chaucer scholars than confronting the myriad of ways that other Chaucerians have found to excuse their poet from the charge of rape. There was the other meaning of Raptus theory. Perhaps Chaucer was just kidnapping a young woman for a friend to marry, because that would apparently have been all right. There was the credentialing theory at the turn of the century that in Lonsbury's summation, Chaucer had raped Champagne in order to fit in with the aristocracy, and apparently that was all right. There was D.W. Robertson's use of an unrelated court case to argue that Champagne had been financially extorting Ta Chaucer. And then there is the assortment of jilted lover accusations from G.K. Chesterton, there may, quote, there may have been almost any sort of complicated comedy of relations, there may simply have been a bad break and nothing else, end quote from John Gardner, that Chaucer seduced Cecily, we can well believe, end quote. From Derek Brewer, the quote, usual modern male lawyer's view is that the lady was probably seduced and after regretted it, end quote. And in a couple of sentences so horrifying that they have to be read in full, Donald Howard's quote, he may have had an intimate relationship with Cecily and she may, when things went wrong, have threatened to accuse him of rape. Or in the heat of passion or exasperation, he may indeed have raped her, Whatever mitigating circumstances there were, Chaucer did not want the matter to go further, end quote. This history is not the one that's being unmade today. The way generations of Chaucerians have played with the idea of a Cecily Champagne, the way they have rushed to find mitigating circumstances for sexual assault, the way they have wielded the idea of a lying rape victim like a weapon, and make no mistake, this was a weapon with an intended target. For it is no coincidence that the years in which scholars were particularly invested in arguing about the Champagne release, and I would give a general estimation of 1955 to about 1995, were the same exact years in which female participation in the academy as a whole and in medieval studies more specifically was rapidly increasing. I do not mean to charge any individual scholar with misogyny. Indeed, many of these scholars were known for advancing the careers of female students. But I do mean to argue that 20th century's Chaucer studies had a vested interest in reminding women of the contingency of their participation, of how easily violence against them could be excused or turned into a titillating joke, to assert the supremacy of male genius and to turn Chaucer studies itself into only a vehicle for its protection. The historical Geoffrey Chaucer might not have been a rapist, but his critics made Father Chaucer into one. They put rape at the top center of Chaucer's story. And it is not cancellation to say that that history is not going away today or tomorrow or ever, because the truth is that Chaucer studies has changed and is capable of changing even more. Cecily Champagne has been a part of that change, a part of the threat that male academics have sensed from the people pushing for a more inclusive field, pushing to undermine the entrenchments of power. So I'm relieved, sure, that the historical Chaucer didn't rape Champagne for, for her sake, 
But I'll be more relieved if you all keep the questions that the Champagne Raptus release raised about power and injustice and violence and the excuses that we make for men of genius still in the forefront of your writing and your reading and your classrooms. It is a different Chaucer we must learn and a different Chaucer that we are called upon to teach, but still gladly at times, I hope, for all of that. Thank you. I think I can thank professors Beckley, Harris, and Seal on behalf of all of us attending this webinar for having, at a moment when so many questions have been answered, offered so many provocative new questions and issues to consider about the Champagne release. I think I meant to turn this back over to Sean to um, field questions at this point. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Thanks. OK. Well, thank you very much for all those contributions. We've um, We've begun the process of addressing the issues that these discoveries have raised, and we've heard a lot about where they might go in the kind of considered editions of the, the pieces in the journals, but also how they've reacted to the presentation today. And obviously we've got a lot of questions, which um, hopefully we'll get through in about 25 minutes, I guess we've got for discussion. Um, they might jump around a little bit because they've come in as people have responded to what was said on the screen and a lot relate to Cecily's status, her agency, her position. Uh, so I thought we'd start off with one from Rachel Warburton, which is about this new research suggests that Champagne exercised considerable agency in negotiating her employment. Much of the language modern critics use to describe her, such as calling her Chaucer's ward, suggests a lack of agency. How did historians decide that Champagne was Chaucer's ward rather than an employee? And what was that based on? So I don't know who wants to kick off responding to that, please. Uh, Sean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take that. Uh, thank you. I think it's a, that's an interesting question. It's, uh, it's got a couple of layers. Um, I'd, I mean, I, I'd start by having to admit that I think the theory to which you're alluding that she, that, that Champagne was Chaucer's ward is not one that's particularly current. At least I can't think of it in writing. Um, people have talked, uh, myself included, about wardship in connection with her, but she was not a ward. Um, and I mean, as for agency, well, we, we don't really know whether she negotiated the terms of her um, um, contract transfer, as it were, or whether, in fact, uh, Chaucer had hired middlemen uh, to, to arrange that. So we, we simply do not have an answer there as to her agency. But I think we should be thinking about her agency. And, uh, and I think um, among the responses you'll find, I think, I think um, Carissa, it's your essay that talks, I think, about, about servitude, isn't it? And, and about female agency. I mean, I think it's a fantastic question, um, but, and it raises two questions that we simply don't know enough about. Can I pick up on that very briefly as well? Um, think it, just building on what Sebastian said there, it's um it's really interesting to think about agency in the in this kind of dispute that's going on against Staunton, particularly related to the role of the attorney in all of this. And that's something that Chaucer's attorney is kind of leading this process. He is in the court, he, he's managing this administrative bureaucratic process. And I think looking into the role of those middlemen is a is, is going to be a really good way of understanding how Chaucer and shop people like Champagne interacted with the courts in this way. Can we just follow that a bit further then in talking about what she actually did in her employment and what her kind of relationship in terms of work was? Um, and I guess it sort of follows on that if she was an important member of the household, why would Standard have litigated to pursue a lost servant? Um, because of the expense of actually taking a case to court. You know, there's lots of fees at every stage of producing these documents, uh, of attorney's fees as well. So any, any thoughts about how these things fit together, what her kind of role was and how she actually related to her, the men around her in terms of her daily life? In terms of making it worthwhile to pursue these cases, so we have um, examples in the, in the article of some of the damages that might be paid out in um, accusations under statute of labourers. It's very hard to judge exactly what those damages were uh, because they often start very high. We have examples of £40 being claimed for a servant being taken. So I think in part we need to consider what we're considering as servitude here as well. 
um, often those damages are taken right down to a few shillings and a few pence, having started at a very high point. So there's, there's obviously negotiation built into all of this. Unfortunately, we have absolutely no idea in terms of her, her what she was doing in terms of the job. Andrew might want to, to jump in on this in a second because he's actually in the article, in the journal, produced an amazing biography, the first one of Cecily Champagne. But unfortunately, as it was settled outside of court, these, these writs only have an extremely limited amount of information in them. And unless, the pleadings, unless it goes to full pleadings, we often don't pick up that um, extra information. Uh, but yeah, Andrew yeah, might yeah. have... There's, well, there's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. The, um, uh, the thing, I was very struck by the discussion thus far about the kind of prurient uh, uh, historiography and literature that's grown up around, around Cecily. Um, um, and which is this consistent reference to her as a baker's daughter, uh, which I, I think is prurient in itself. She was the daughter of a London baker, but it was a London baker who owned property and was actually described at one point as um, uh, a grain merchant. So it's kind of quite high end. Uh, but her, her, her father died early. Um, her mother then married Edward III Sadler, um, uh, married a very rich man, a very powerful man. Um, uh, and who uh, himself acquired a great deal of, of property, and um, whose uh, Cecily's brother uh, became uh, a member of the royal household with Chaucer. And, and the fact that uh, Cecily's brother was a member of the royal household, I think may partly explain why fairly high-end people get involved, for example, um, in, in some of the documents relating to the Champagne case. Um, uh, so she was not she was not a low-end person, as it were. She was quite, she was really of a very similar social background to Chaucer himself. Uh, of the various uh, statute of laborers uh, cases that one can trace, often with women, what's striking um, is, that, is that in the case of women, it's often a, a, an accusation against the employer and the, um, uh, and the employee. So it's the man and the woman. And um, frequently the woman, the impression one gets is that the woman in an urban context uh, is at quite a senior position within the household. That's partly because of the terminology that's used and partly because of the damages involved. So I, I would suggest, we haven't any firm evidence, it's unfortunate, we, we, didn't, we don't get further details unless these cases came to trial and it didn't come to trial, but I'd suggest um, that she probably assumed a fairly senior position within Chaucer's household. Thank you. Chris Whittix very helpfully put something into the, um, the question as well, which is he noticed that um, Cecily's surety was William Mimp, and that led him to two certificates of statute merchant, um, both of which involve Ellis Mimp, a citizen and embroiderer of London. And it seems to him that it's at least possible that Chaucer chose Mimp as a surety on account of an existing connection with Cecily, perhaps a former apprentice of the Mimp concern. So further references to Ellis Mimp occur on the plea and memoranda rolls of London, uh, one of a complaint against Mimp for beating and mistreating his apprentice, a daughter of a Reading man, in 1369, and on the close trolls, an Adam Mimp, an embroiderer, is recorded in 1376. So that's another little bit of evidence that perhaps adds a bit more context to the, the life story as well, but obviously it will require a bit more uh, investigation in relation to what's already been presented. There's, There's an important more, point there, Sean, uh, in relation to searching successfully, as it were, um, is that uh, both she and her siblings, um, after her mother's remarriage um, to William Pickerel, um, uh, use the surnames Champagne and Pickerel fairly in, uh, interchangeably. So if you see uh, a Cecily Pickerel, that's quite likely to be Cecily Champagne. Uh, I'd just like to thank Chris, uh, Chris Whittick for this reference. We, we weren't aware of it, but this is brilliant. And um, I'm sure you and I will um, pursue it. Yes, we, 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 we noted in the, the we, we noted in the article itself that the the, the MIM suggestion was a uh, subject to uh, many different readings. So that we yeah we'll we'll look into that. I think. So to change um, direction slightly, there's quite a few questions come in about 
the term raptus and how that appears in the records in other contexts or in the same context in more numerous examples. Um, for example, has it surfaced in cases involving men, but also to how many kind of cases have you come across in the surveying of the records in similar circumstances or in, in perhaps very different cases? So is it is it something which is very obvious looking at the plea rolls and the other other process documents, or is this a focus point on, on Cecily kind of allowed that as a, as a future question and a future direction for research? There are a huge number. Uh, Andrew, could you unmute yourself? You're on mute, Andrew. Um, uh, sorry, I jumped in there without thinking to unmute. That's a classic. Um, uh, the, the, it's interesting the way in which the term does occur quite often. In fact, another thing we've recently found in the King's Bench Files in respect to 1381 is that unlike the Jacquery, we thought there weren't any cases of rape um, in 1381, but we've, I've recently uh, identified the first reference to a rebel being accused of, of, of raptus. Uh, in the context of 1381. And that appears to be an abduction, as far as I, I can make out. Um, uh, but there are very large numbers, whether you're looking at appeals of rape, which are the, uh, uh, the, the, the agent, the, the, the means by which women who are victims of rape uh, could bring a prosecution, or whether you're looking at um, uh, member uh, husbands uh, bringing cases of uh, alleged abduction. There are very, it's a very large number. It's a very pervasive culture. Um, and the, uh, I mean, the key case that John Post uh, wrote about uh, many years ago is the, is the, is the case of Thomas West um, in Hampshire, uh, where Nicholas Clifton uh, was accused of uh, abducting uh, Thomas's, uh, um, uh, Thomas's daughter uh, in a form of indictment that suggested that he was trying at the same time uh, to resurrect uh, 1381. So it's, there's, a, there's, a lot, um, uh, there's a lot there. And I, I, I think the comments about whether you might think of a rape culture are not too misplaced. Uh, Chris, you want to, uh, Chris Cannon wants to come in in response to that. Yeah, I'd just like to point out that in the article that's been referred to some from um, 1993, in which I describe the discovery of the second copy of the release, there are a whole bunch of cases, that's really the body of the article, which use the word raptus, in which it's glossed as lay with her carnally against her will. And so, you've got that wonderful case of the, of the, of the uh, where um, uh, the, there, there's an attempt to, to uh, waylay a victim uh, on her way to Westminster Hall. Um, uh, I was trying to remember the details while, while we, were, uh, we were talking, which is in that article. Uh, and it's a, it's a really extraordinary case. Um, yeah, uh, so, so there are there are cases to, to be looked at, um, to, to think about the meaning of this word still. Um, um, and um, the other thing I think one might add is that in terms of thinking about the legal precision of it, one thing you notice in the King's Bench files is that the, the clerks of the King's Bench have very clear categorizations. Um, uh, so that, for example, Brits uh, of raptors which were largely abduction um, were clearly designated by them as writs under the statute and distinguished from the VA armist writs that, uh, uh, that Ewan was talking about earlier. So, so the files actually, again, potentially provide a key for us understanding what the distinctions were, perhaps a little more clearly than we have done already. Thank you. And just before we move um, away from the legal process, there's a couple of, of questions from Richard Green, which kind of dig into that a little bit more. One is about the quick claim and how um, the force of an action of quick claim, you know, to have any legal force, it, it's Staunton who should be issuing the quick claim. And then to go into something around, um, I suppose, what's incriminating about the release from actions. Uh, how is abduction of a servant a felony? It's kind of a more technical question about the process of law in this specific case, but I wonder if, if there's any quick way to answer that before we move on to some other questions. I, I think if I can jump, jump in on, on, on Richard's question, the, the one about uh, Staunton having to issue this. I think this is not to do, but it is, it, it's, it's not about an action of, of raptors. It's about Chaucer and uh, Cecily 
choosing the release as the most efficient and best, and for Chaucer, probably actually only way of countering the accusation of trespass, that is of having um, uh, taken Cecily out of her former contract against her will. Because that's the only way in which it's actually liable. Because he would not necessarily be, uh, it could not necessarily be, be pursued under the statute of, um, of, of laborers. But in order to, to show that he did not take her against her will, um, she would have to write a, a general release showing that she left of her own will and that Chaucer was not involved in arranging her new employment. Um, um, and, if, and the only way to do that, and the most efficient way, is, uh, is the sort of general, uh, general uh, release, both the um, close world, uh, uh, world's version and then the reworded, um, for its different context, King's Bench uh, release that, um, that, um, that um, Chris found. So in that case, it's, it has nothing to do with Staunton being involved in the process. It needs to be a document that shows in these courts that Cecily um, vouches for her own um, uh, um, uh, own actions, as it were, and not Chaucer having made her do anything. It's it's to clear uh, um, Chaucer in that respect. It it, it wouldn't clear her, um, uh, but that's a different part of uh, uh, of that uh, of that uh, um, yeah uh, uh, of of the entire matter. Okay, there's some been some questions and comments for the respondents as well. Um, Kate Coppy has, has put one in about how you've talked about what these revelations change and what they do not change. And it's really a question about what impact this, these findings will have on the way you present Chaucer in the undergraduate classroom um, and how this will change the syllabus. I mean, it's quite quite a sudden, a sudden question to, um, to incorporate into thinking about teaching. But I just wondered if you've got any initial thoughts about how approaches might change as a result of these new documents. I can answer this briefly. Um, so what I will probably do when I teach Chaucer in the spring uh, is I will have my students read the special issue, um, read it all, and then perhaps write uh, write a response that incorporates stuff from the special issue and also explicitly discusses the role of servant women in the text. So, you know, kind of I'll give them some passages, uh, including the ones that I discussed today to look at um, and to analyze in greater detail, given the material in the special issue. Um, I would I would say for myself, I, I don't know that it will change much aside from some factual difference. I, I do always begin, I'll also be teaching Chaucer in the spring, um, and I do always begin with a short um, biographical essay, so that will obviously need to be nuanced some. Um, but I have always taught Chaucer through a lens of being somewhat critical about um, the subject that um, Professor Seal talked about, about the way that sort of Father Chaucer has been embedded in this um, kind of network of assumptions about who he is for and how he re we relate to him. And I, I often actually begin with the preface to um, Don Howard's biography for that very reason, which um, uh, asserts that the real Chaucer is the one that we can read, uh, much more real than the one who may have raped Champagne. Um, and I, I think this is sort of what a number of, of our responses get at is that um, we can, I've always sort of grounded this on, um, the perpetuation of assumptions about um, assault, violence, gender, bodies, all of these things. And I think that that doesn't need to change, shouldn't change, should be um, our sort of call going forward. Um, I agree with both uh, professors Harris and Buckley. I think the only other thing I'd add um, is that, you know, in a way, I wasn't just teaching about rape when I talked about Cecily Champagne and Chaucer. You know, I think one of the things that we need to kind of continue to work on in our syllabi is to not just talk about Jews when we talk about the priorist's tale or not just talk about women when we talk about the wife of Bath. And so I think in a way, this is just going to kind of continue that so that we are going to talk about rape frequently in my, in my Canterbury Tales class. And we'll be talking about all the other things as well. And that in some ways, the kind of the pinpointing of rape to only really be about Cecily Champagne or perhaps the Reeves tale, you know, a couple of these other places in some ways is, is disadvantaging our students because these themes of sexual violence and male power um, are throughout the tales. They're, they constitute the Canterbury Tales. They, there is no Canterbury Tales without them. And so in some ways, I think it's a much smaller switch, um, although I hope other people kind of continue to do that as well and just to talk more broadly in their classes about these themes. 
Thank you. Now there was um, a question really for Carissa, which Sebastian and Ewan might want to, to chip in to as well, which is Carissa's work on working class women stresses that working class women were frequently treated as sexual objects or resources to men of all classes. And it's as staunch in charge as might be asserting that she was procured or taken away. Um, does that, I'm oh, sorry, I just lost it. And uh, without her employer's permission, might not the use of raptors be carrying a sexual connotation either or both of the implication that Chaucer had secured her employment in order to have sexual access to her from which she releases him or that viewing her as a sexual resource motivated the charge on Staunton's part? Yeah, I mean, I can briefly address that. You know, absolutely, this you know this this new valence, this new labor context of raptus does not foreclose uh, the sexual connotations of raptus, uh, and I think it's worth reading this in the context of uh, rape cases brought by uh, female servants, uh, which are very kind of detailed, explicit, and very sad, uh, which shed light on how employers kind of viewed servants as sexually available, uh, as kind of sexually viable, and uh, as without having recourse uh, for their harms. Can I just add to that actually? Yes. Um, one of the things that I very much appreciated about um, working on this issue and the way that Sebastian and Ewan handled it in particular is um, they're very cautious about reminding us that because this individual use of raptus does not index sexual assault, that does not mean um, that none sort of ever occurred, right? Um, either between Chaucer and Champagne or just committed by Chaucer in general. And so I think that's an important reminder is that, um, and of course, this is the point that, that um, certainty or uncertainty certainties makes right um what exists in the legal record is not the full story ever and so i think we should remember that um what this record tells us is not going to be the full story of how chaucer is embedded in rape culture so. yeah, if i can just uh, chime in here i think sarah that's a that's an excellent point um and I think we, we, we really want to guard against uh, sort of attempts to clearing the term raptors or clearing Chaucer and his culture, um, as it were, um, of, of, uh, of uh, sexual violence. Um, but I mean, so at the same time, I, there's kind of two reactions that I will, that I already imagine as problematic for me personally, is that the, the one group of uh, colleagues who will be, you know, uh, extremely um, relieved that Chaucer uh, is cleared of this rape. I mean, that's um, uh, that's probably you know n not a, um, not a line. I I think we should we should invest a lot of time and effort in. And the other one is to find theories or or, or try to maintain this uh, uh, the the or uphold uh, the possibility that 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 Chaucer um, had in fact um, uh, raped. Uh, um, Champagne any more than he would have raped anybody else, right? So the probability now that Chaucer and, and there the was sexual violence between uh, uh, Chaucer and Cecily Champagne is about the same as between um, uh, other women appearing in his life record and 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 in and in other uh, medieval life records as well, right? So I think there is nothing that would suggest that there was anything in particular about these two. Um, so it's not about clearing um, Chaucer's name. Um, but it's also, it can't be about uh, trying to sort of find ways of um, uh, uh, justifying um, um, uh, uh, allegations of rape here. And I just want to sort of make, make one final remark about raptors. I think the easiest way to think about the elasticity of this term and about so many common law terms um, is to think of trespass. I mean, when trespass started, it may have really been the physical act of trespass. But since then, we all are quite familiar with the notion of trespass in the law, in, in the common law, as, as, uh, as, an, as an abstract extended usage that is applied to a wide, um, um, uh, wide array of, of, of situations. And it turns out with raptors that this is, uh, well, we, we've known that, as Chris said, with raptors for a long time. In fact, Chris's own uh, uh, research is, is also built on, on work in the 1970s and, and 80s of um, uh, Raptors being used very flexibly in in cases of um, abduction. In fact, even even in wardship context. To come back to one of the to one of the earlier questions, so it just turns out that raptors is is just a little bit of a 
uh, of a more more pliable and and elastic term than we had uh, uh, earlier assumed, which does not mean that uh, those uses of raptors that have to do with um, with sexual violence are now no longer um, uh, um, uh, uh, pertinent. And, and, and you could actually argue the way in which. Uh, the idea of raptors gets extended so that other people take control of it. Uh, so that, as in the 1382 statute of uh, uh, rapes, a father uh, can bring uh, a felony action uh, over the abduction of his daughter without reference to his daughter, as it were. Um, that extension of control is in, a, is in a way very chilling in itself. Um, and the, uh, if, if we link uh, the raptors reference in the Chancery Quick Claim to uh, uh, the, the Labourers legislation suggests that there may have been a, a move over in a similar way under the statutes of Labourers to exert greater control over women in, in the labour market, as it were. I could just jump in there too, just for a sec. You know, I think one part of the conversation that hasn't, you know, that isn't typically pulled into the champagne conversation is also Ch Chaucer's relationship with Philippa, with his own wife. And so I think that when we start thinking more about champagne as a uh, successfully champagne as a person over whom Chaucer is exerting power and, you know, has these structural, um, relationships with. You know, I think it's also then important to, to think of it in, in her in terms of the other women who Chaucer also has some of these systemic relationships with, who he also is able to um, control to some degree. And so I think that um, obviously servants and wives are different, but thinking about the ways in which um, these there's a kind of a broad category of women with whom Chaucer is having these interactions um, and these kinds of power over. Thank you. And just to pick that up, um, Wendy Scase has asked a sort of follow-on question about what we can infer from Cecily's issue of the release, and was it common in such cases as the records show? And what, what was it in her interests to um, to make this a formal legal situation, or is it something that Chaucer and his attorneys might have arranged to defend Chaucer's interests? And what does that imply about her agency in relation to the law and its processes? I think we certainly can't rule out coercion as um, something that's going on here. I think we need to bear that in mind throughout that. I mean, obviously, in the quick claim, Chaucer's got his his powerful mates around him. And he's possibly also there's, there's a few options for who Thornton could be. There's a possibility that he's in the royal household as well as a coffer of the royal household. So there is this kind of high level. Um, male dispute potentially, which Sean Payne's in the middle of. So I think don't think we can we can rule that out that that aspect of anything. But I think it also just demonstrates how a grey area procurement is at this time, and and what cases are being brought as procurement, and how successful are they are they going to be, and what is procurement? Is it a trespass? Is it a, an action of um, a contract? Even the justices don't really know themselves. We see the legal debates around all of this. So I do think it, it shows how little we know about what's going on in these disputes and how little, how much is lost just as you track those little pieces of information from the archive together and you're trying to pull this, this large story. I think, yeah, we, we kind of lose champagne in the middle of it sometimes. So we're probably coming to the end of um, questions. There's a couple around the archive and what we might want to do with this material, one of which relates to digitization and how realistic is it to think about approaching the, the new files and the, the, the preceptor files as a resource that might be digitized and how about that might then link to the AALT website. Um, which has produced a lot of images of, of medieval and early modern legal records. Just what are the, the plans for kind of deepening our relationship to these records more generally, because this is quite a specific case and you've really unveiled the possibilities here with this collection. Um, just how might we approach this as a, as a wider resource digitally, I think. One thing for me on this is, um, is actually, this has been a really lovely collaborative project and I think it's drawn interest to the file, to files that would not normally be used or even be, a, a, be kind of aware of in literary circles. So I think part of it is 
is having these collaborative discussions and talking more and just trying to make the case. It's going to it's going to cost money to make all of this available because a lot of the files are not in great condition. A lot of the files need work. They need listing, cataloging. And we've got an amazing cataloging team, but we kind of need that interest from the wider academic community to justify what we're doing. Um, I mean, I would love to to do a brand new digital choice of life records resource and get all get all this so we can add to it as new things are found and we can we can build this resource amongst the community. Um, that's just what I would love to do. <laughs> it's been it's been amazing working with um, in such a collaborative way with all the respondents and with Sebastian and Andrew. I, mean, I, think, I think you have to bear in mind what a terrible condition the files are in. Uh, they've been underneath rubble for centuries and very little has been done to them. And if I can share my screen, we'll see if that happens. No, it won't work. But I've got a wonderful picture of a, of a, of a file for Richard II's uh, reign, which has a big felt tip notice um, by CAF Meekings on it saying, uh, coagulant decay never open except for repair. That's the sort of thing you come across with the files. They're very difficult to open um, and, and use. And also many of them st are still in our salt mine in Cheshire and just still need to be brought to light um, before they can be even looked at. But uh, Sorry, I muted myself as I said, David's got his hand up. I think if you wanted to come in. If, if, if I can, if I can just break in for a second, though, if you check in the chat, the link to the specialist of choice review is, is given there it's, and the issue is now online. Thank you. Okay, we'll begin to um, to wrap this up. I don't know if anyone wants to um, offer any closing comments, either the editors or Sebastian or Ewan, just to round up how the two strands of scholarship have come together today and basically opened up all these new possibilities of, of cooperation and the relationship between the sources in the archive and the thinking around how they relate to the, the scholarship and the actual literary sources themselves. I think for us in the archives, it's really opened um, our eyes to how we can employ these, these hidden records in many different ways across different periods. This is a really good example of how the stories in the past can be explored in, in kind of a, a different tangential kind of way. So I think from our point of view, it's really exciting to think about these different communities of scholars that can come together through the, the evidence that's in these often forgotten and difficult to get to records. So I don't know if anyone wants to just pick up on that as we begin to wind up. I'm, I'm, I'm happy just to, to jump in. Um, I, I don't need to have the last word on this, but I just wanted to uh, really sort of con con confirm what, what Ewan said. It's been really, it's been a wonderful process. And I think Ewan and I, we have been talking about Chaucer Life Records for the last seven, eight years. And it's been, it's been a great uh, relationship between a literary scholar and, and a historian who works with, uh, with the archive. So all I can say is that, you know, to all my literary colleagues out there, you know, find a historian, find um, find an archivist buddy. If you don't have the skills yourself, you know, build them, uh, work with others. Because the thing is, we the records, and this is something that I think Chris said to me when we spoke a few weeks ago, is that the records are often where we expect them to be once we know where to look for them. So many of these finds, and I've been working through the archives as, as a number of you know over the last few years, and many of these finds are really not that difficult to discover. <laughs> so we just simply need to know more about each other's work um, and, and where we can you know, uh, uh, enhance uh, uh, our research. It's, it's, it's a joint process. And, and the National Archives have been absolutely phenomenal um, in, in making it available and, and supporting my research over the last decade. So I think this is, this is just the sort of latest installment of this. And it's been just a joy working with you. Just to echo that, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. And if, if you, any of you are, are in the archives and come and chat to us on the desks, like we're always interested to hear what people are getting up to and kind of just chat about it. So yeah, do come and say hello if you come in.
So as David said, the um, the link to Ewan and Sebastian's article and to Ewan and Andrew's article is now in the chat. Um, that's the open access part of the special edition, which has literally um, been dropped at half past five our time this evening. Um, it's Chaucer Review, volume 57, number four, and it is titled The Case of Geoffrey Chaucer and Cecily Champagne, New Evidence. Um, so it, it just remains for me to thank everyone very much indeed for their contributions, especially to all the presenters and speakers. There's been a huge amount of thought gone into this, a huge amount of research behind it. I think we've all benefited from your experience, either as Chaucer scholars or as archival scholars, and we can see how the two things are meshing together as a blueprint for this kind of work in future, uh, especially to the audience as well. I think the, um, the liveliness of the chat has really demonstrated how excited people are by this discovery and how it will change the way they think about this topic, but also inspiring them hopefully to do more, more of this kind of collaborative work. So I would just like to say on behalf of the archives and everyone involved, thank you. Thanks also to, um, to Molly, Rachel and Liz in the background who facilitated this webinar and made sure all the links work and have kept everyone on time and in check. Um, so thank you to them as well. And hopefully we will all reflect on these contributions as we read the journal and digest the contents. So thank you very much.